Good afternoon. I'm Rene Delu, and I'd like to speak to you today about managing does and bucks for successful breedings. Um, I've been in the commercial dairy goat industry for a number of years, so what I'd like to uh, present to you is basically based on experience which I've gathered from, from some years of doing it. Um, some of the things I would like to cover today um, under management goals are, uh, and again, uh, each one of these topics is actually a topic in itself, and you could spend quite a bit of time on it, which is not the intent of, of what I want to present today. Um, but just keep in mind, there's a lot more information can be found out about each one of these topics. But what I would like to basically cover is nutrition, uh, very vital in, in managing and, and taking care of your animals, uh, certainly reproduction and out of season breeding, uh, biosecurity, very, very important these days, um, pregnancy checks and uh, knowing wh when your goats are pregnant, um, breeding soundness exams um, for, for does and certainly for bucks. And how do I decide what animals to select for? Um, linear appraisal, uh, which is one of the selection criteria. And I also use DHI records, which is another selection criteria based on, on milk production. Uh, we have to have a method of rec record keeping. So we keep track of all the progress and, and health management on the animals and also where you can find sources of breeding information. So let's get started. Uh, nutrition is, is vitally important, of course. And if, if we're gonna have milking animals or any kind of uh, goats or other creatures, uh, we have to have um, good nutrition. And, you know, if we're doing uh, milk production, we have to have um, adequate requirements that are met through NRC or um, uh, balanced rations. And uh, this, this benefits in an extended lactation and also benefits in keeping up their body condition scores, which I'll talk to you about a little later and is, is, is vital in keeping up that milk production. One of the questions that always comes up is, um, where do you find nutrition help? That's, it's, it's a difficult question and, and the answer is not always readily available. Of course, we have uh, Cor uh, Cornell uh, Extension Agency and, and perhaps other extension uh, programs who are available, but as I'm finding out um, in, in my area is that uh, the, the extension offices have kind of bunched together and that some of the specific areas don't always have the nutrition help, so you have to reach out further, but Cornell has been a re great resource. Um, you can certainly use your, your feed production uh, person to help you uh, derive a ration, and, and it can be very good or it cannot be so good, depending on if they're selling you a certain product that they want to really try to push. Um, um, but again, I, I would really rely on Cornell or, or some of the uh, extension folks primarily. So some of the nutrition basics that you will use, especially if you're working with dairy goats, is uh, you're going to be feeding some sort of a concentrate. And uh, it can be in a coarse mix, which is like a, a, a molasses-based coarse grain mix, which is, I find, the goats find very palatable. Um, a little harder to come by, a little harder to use if you're, if, uh, if you're using equipment to move it around because the molasses tends to stick on the equipment. Um, you can certainly get a pelleted ration from a manufacturer and they're totally balanced. The beauty of that is that everything is combined in, in the pellet. So the certain things and minerals and so forth don't sift out like they might in a coarse mix. Um, so that's, that's definitely a benefit. Um, the other thing I have used in the past is like a roasted soybean and basically that was an, just an additive to boost up the protein because uh, roasted soybeans can have as much as 40 percent protein so you can give a very little bit and really boost, uh, boost up that protein in the ration for a milking animal. Um, 
forage is vitally important. They have to have that long, long uh, hay type forage. Um, baleage has been very much used in various forms. As you see the picture there, it's just a, uh, it's a, it's a, a round bale of baleage with a cattle panel wrapped around it and it's just put out there. Uh, the thing that you have to keep in mind with baleage is there's a spoilage factor. The minute it comes out of its wrap, um, it starts to degrade and the quality goes down. So by day four, if it isn't used up, you, you would have to take it out, which would be a real waste. So it's primarily good for using in uh, in larger groups, or you can certainly unwrap it and feed it out. It's just a little more labor intensive. Um, or you could be using a good quality dry hay, which is a lot of small operations would tend to do. Um, if you store it carefully and, and feed it correctly, it can be uh, a good substitute if you're not using baleage. Um, the thing about that is goats do tend to waste, so you have to have a certain um, feeding system or feeding feed bunk so they tend not to waste it because uh, it's, it's very expensive and you don't want to lose that. Uh, of course the bottom line on any of these things is get a feed analysis done of your of your hay or your baleage or, or your ration and what I have found in the past is that um, if you can and you're not a farmer who's farming his own hay and those kinds of products, you're, you're almost better off buying it because you can control the quality of what you're buying. A lot of times farmers are forced into using the products they have made on their farm because if you've made it, you gotta use it, you can't throw it away and it's not always the quality. So you end up feeding something that's not as, as good a quality as, as perhaps you would like or should have. Um, the other thing, um, that is, is a good consideration if you're a larger operation is a total mixed ration. And the beauty of that is it just takes the concentrates and, and the uh, forages and it puts it all together in a, in a rough form that's blended basically. And uh, it includes all the, the goodies you need. And each bite should actually be the same as the next bite. So they're getting everything they need from, from each bite. Um, it does allow for different um, rations to be made or with simple changes from one group to the next. Again, this is something that's going to be more in uh, positive or more working for you if you have a larger operation rather than a small operation. <clears throat> uh, finally, but certainly not last, is water. They have to have good, clean, nutritious uh, well, not nutritious so much, but clean, palatable water. And uh, I, I don't like it when I go out to the to the barn if they have a water tub and it's dirty. I mean, I always say if if I wouldn't drink the mill, uh, drink the water, I don't. I wouldn't expect my animals to do so either. Uh, moving along, um, getting into body nutrition, uh, body condition scoring. Uh, there's a chart that goes from actually one to six. Now, most of the charts that uh, actually get used um, go from one to like five. I included six some years ago because I found that there, was, there were some goats that just didn't fit into the five categories. But, but quite frankly, if you've got a goat that's a six and you can, you can see where, where that's at, they're obese, uh, they shouldn't be in your herd, but it's it's something you you, you got to look at. Um, so basically, going from the one to the six, you know, if if and the next slide will show a few pictures. Um, if there's if there's like no flesh and it's it's an emaciated animal, there's there's probably a health problem going on. Uh, generally, you're going to find the animals being between two and four in a dairy operation and different times of the lactation or, ge or gestation, um, they can go from, uh, from two to four. Um, primarily in, in a lact in, during a lactation, I like to see animals staying in a three to 3.5. That means they're, they're sort of balancing their, their body needs as well as, as milking. And certainly if they're, if they're pregnant and you know, dry, they need to be at a three, I'd say a 3.5 
uh, because they'll tend to lose that uh, extra condition a little bit right after kidding and they'll slip back down to a three. So three to 3.5, I find ideal. Again, a lot of times you won't see 3.5 in a, in a chart, but I found that a lot of the does I've dealt with have been in that category. So again, I included it. Um, this is a picture of, of just a few goats. Uh, the one is, is an emaciated animal. It's a number one. Uh, probably some health issues going on there as well. Usually just a deficiency in nutrition is, wouldn't cause that. There's, there's something else going on too. Again, could be uh, just a certain stage, uh, not, not one I would recommend having, but it does, sometimes animals do slip into, into a two and then regain it after a while. Uh, three and a four, those are the ideal, and those are nice little boar goats, not quite what, what a dairy goat might look like, but, but it's indicative of the condition and where conditions should be uh, for most of their goats' lifetimes. <clears throat> um, I think we'll get on to reproduction a little bit. Um, goats being seasonal uh, animals, and then there's some shot slides coming up about that. Um, I always find that, you know, as it says, days get shorter, the nights get cooler, and the bucks uh, become get their wonderful odor, and the does get interested. And so that is uh, a real sign that the breeding season has started, even though it's not necessarily always by the calendar or by the uh, the uh, the uh, sensitivity time. Um, this is a nice little chart that uh, uh, comes in handy to kind of keep you, give you an idea of, of when uh, the breedings can occur. Uh, I have found that I don't totally agree with it because uh, even though uh, <clears throat> it you know you should have the uh, the fall equinox which is like in September I find that uh, I'm getting a lot of breeding already in in late July or in August and uh, so that it, it's a little bit skewed but it's but uh, you know photosensitivity wise it's it's on target but it just doesn't quite match what happens with the goats. <clears throat> So this, this is, again, um, looking at the an anestrous period, which is the out of season period, and uh, kind of indicates when, when does should get bred by the calendar, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't necessarily match what happens in, in, in real time. Um, and, and it also depends on, of course, uh, where you're at. Um, I find that even though it's a photosensitivity, uh, critical, it, I also find that certain areas of the country, uh, it's, it's a little bit different. And also if you're dealing with a little different breed, um, you know, certainly the Nubian goats are breeding a little more out of season than the, say than the Alpines or the Sonnens. <clears throat> um, so some of the reproduction methods that, that we should briefly look at are, um, you know, if it's out of if it's out of season breeding, uh, and this means again in the anestra season when generally uh, you would not be breeding goats, uh, but if you're in an, if in a milking operation and you feel like you need to uh, extend those lactations or get them to breeding uh, out of season because uh, your milk supply and your milk uh, products markets depends on it then you have to sometimes do that because we all know that goats breed, you know, in, in the fall uh, and tend to dry off. And then if you have a winter market or, or a very early spring market that depends on that milk, you need to be able to get that milk and not all the does hold up. So you have to breed more often during the year than, than, than nature would allow. Uh, so one of the ways you can do that very easily, uh, even, Again, not totally in, in nester season, but certainly uh, on both ends of the season is to, if you have your bucks and your does separated from uh, each other, introduce them. And it's amazing how, how nature will just take its course. Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
The other thing to consider is out of season uh, by doing some manipulation through either lights or hormonal. Um, if you're doing uh, full, what we call photoperiod control, which is, which is a very effective and non-invasive method um, for, for breeding goats, um, you basically, and then you can see the, on the chart how, what, what it takes to do that. Uh, you basically have to have uh, a space that's controlled by, by a certain amount of intense light, whether it's fluorescent or LED. And uh, it needs to be like 200 lux at the doe eye level. And it's interesting uh, because the first thing I have people ask is, well, what, what does that mean, 200 lux? Well, it's interesting that now there is a, an app that you can put on your iPhone and you can actually measure that. So if, if it's a total mystery as to what that is, there's an app for that. There's an app for everything. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The procedure for that is basically have them in that, in that light, lighted space for between 16 to 20 hours for about 45 to 60 days. You, you change that and reduce it to the ambient light for 35 days. And then if you do the same for the bucks and the does and then bring them together, um, they will start breeding very quickly. And in my experience, that is usually like a, a small brush fryer. The first day you'll have one and then the second day you'll have more. So you really have to keep your buck and, and does ratio like one to 15 because that buck will just, he, he won't be able to breed all the ones that are coming into heat so quickly. And um, so you have to have enough bucks for, for enough does. So, and again, all those have to be kept separate. The bucks can be kept together, uh, but they can't be kept with the does. Um, I have found um, over the years that the, the results are quite interesting, that the early bred groups, usually from February to April, can be 91% uh, conception rates from the out of season using the lights. Um, if you if you go a little further out and it go to May, it, it goes down to like between 80 and 87 percent. And the whole season, all all uh, from February to like June, is like 78 percent. So it, it's pretty effective if you use it. But again, you've got to have the space. Uh, to separate everyone, and you've got to have the space to be able to alienate, uh, you know, the, the certain groups from everybody else. And I have found that it, it works well in yearlings because uh, if you have a, a separate facility where you keep your yearlings, uh, it works well. If you have, if you try to do it on your milking group, you can do that, but you don't want all your milkers in that, in that, uh, synchronization group because then they'll all come into heat and that's what, not what you're trying to achieve. So you have to be able to keep separate groups and that's not always easy for every farmer to do, but that's, you know, but it, but it's, it's there and it does work. Um, here's just a quick picture of, of a barn um, with, with the lights, the old fluorescent lights, but it was one of the breeding groups. And of course those doors in the back would be closed down and there would be uh, covers over the door, over the windows, leaving enough light or enough air to come in, but not really be, be affected by the uh, natural daylight. Um, very quickly, uh, the other part of, of uh, synchronization can be through hormonal control. Um, this is not generally allowed for dairies, uh, but, but you can, but, uh, some people do do it, and there's been a various number of products over the years. The most recent one is, you'll see the one on the on the lower right. It's the uh, called the Cedars, and they are actually used in dairy cattle, and they are approved for dairy sheep, but believe it or not, they're not approved for dairy goats. At least not in the U.S. They're used in New Zealand. They're used in Europe, but in this country, they're not really allowed to be used but it's out there. Um, we should get into biosecurity briefly. Uh, anytime you're dealing with, with, uh, with animals, you, and especially this day and age when people from far and wide come to your farm or you, you may bring animals in from far and wide or even close, um, you have to be concerned about you know the bacteria, the viruses, the parasites, 
So you really have to know, first of all, your herd, what, what are the uh, concerns and what are the uh, weaknesses in your herd that you, you would be concerned about. And then if you're looking at buying stock or bringing in stock, you really have to um, uh, be very observant and ask a lot of questions. And I will give you a quick example. Uh, some years ago, I was actually looking to buy some goats from, from different herds to, to assemble a herd. And one was uh, a longtime breeder who had been in the business for many years. So I took, and I'd known this person, it had very, very nice quality goats, healthy goats. Uh, but because they were distance away, I did not actually go see those animals. And uh, turns out that between the time I had first seen them and, and now that I was buying some animals from them had been like 15 years and the herd had really diminished. The herd manager was not on top of it. And I brought some things in that I regretted afterwards. So to this day, I now say that um, even if it's, if it's a herd, you know, go see those animals but not only uh, see the animals you're buying, you wanna see the ones in the back of the herd, you know, who, who's, who's in the back barn uh, that, they're, that they're not showing you because that indicates, you know, the animals that are in the herd and, and you need to know that. Um, it's very important to work with your veterinarian um, in, in securing animals and in testing animals and, and uh, setting up a health protocol, extremely important. And, uh, you know, use preventative measures, you know, if you're shipping animals or, or bring them into your farm. Uh, reproduction very quickly, once you've done the breeding and, and uh, or you're trying to determine if um, your animals are pregnant, you can either use the ultrasound, which you can see with the ultrasound machine there, um, or you can actually get a milk test from Dairy One and they will, uh, give you those results as well. <clears throat> so we need to get into some breeding soundness exams for does and bucks. Um, so for, before each breeding season, you really need to know, you know, and keep track of, of, of all these things, but you also need to determine the, um, you know, the, the condition scores and the, the general weight category of the animals. Have they lost weight? Have they maintained? Um, you know, it's good to check the teeth, their feet, their eyes, um, everything that you, if you've been working with these animals day to day, you know, a lot of times you don't need to look at this so much individually because you've been working with them. But if, if, you know, if you're, help, if you're has, asking somebody to, to look at your animals and, and, uh, want to perhaps sell them or you buy other animals, you need to be checking these things out. Um, foot rot is always a concern to be uh, to be contained if, if it exists. Um, check your mucous membranes. Uh, use your formatcha and uh, or get fecal counts done by your veterinarian or learn how to do them yourself. It's very important to keep the parasites under control. Um, if it's if if you're dealing with bucks, uh, do a, do a semen evaluation or find out if a semen evaluation has been done on the buck. So you know that uh, the, the semen you might be getting for your, for your AI is, is quality semen or is, is uh, re reproductively sound and will, it will be a, effective in, uh, in, a, uh, in a breeding. Um, again, like anything, you have to keep records of these things because if you have more than just a few animals, you wanna make sure you have records of pre previous health exams and soundness exams. And so you can look back and see if, if things have maintained over the time. <clears throat> so with the bucks, uh, very briefly, um, if you have a buck and, uh, and you're gonna be using for breeding or to get them collected, you do definitely wanna, and, and you can't just go from uh, assuming on these guys because they, uh, they, they get a pretty, uh, should I say that they, they, they uh, urinate on themselves and so forth and don't keep themselves in the, in the greatest of shape. So you really need to check the penis and the prepuce and so forth. 
and, and, and clean it up, uh, maybe shave it down, wash them if you have to, uh, because it does get kind of gross down there and you don't wanna be using those bucks uh, to necessarily breed your does if they're in that condition. Um, you do have to keep an eye on pizzle rot, which you'll, you'll see very quickly. It's, a, it's a, like an infection right around the prepuce and uh, it's, it's easily controlled uh, if, you keep it, if you keep a clean buck. Uh, one big concern in, in bucks and certainly in weathers is uh, the urinary calculi that you want to make sure that the, the bucks are urinating when they should be and, and without straining. And that's all due to the balance of the phosphorus and the cal calcium that's in the ration. So you have to really keep them on that ration and maintain it very well. <clears throat> um, so if, if you do the breeding soundness exams in the bucks, um, you need to do the palpation of the scrotum. And if, you, if you've done this a few times, you'll learn to differentiate uh, very quickly that you know the epididymis at the bottom and, and, uh, and you have to make sure that it's, it's, it's a decent size and nice and firm, but not too firm and that everything is, is, is generally soft and not very hard. Um, if it becomes really hard and it, it almost feels granulated, that means there's a, there's a sperm granuloma in the bucks and uh, it's gonna affect the breeding and the outcome of, of pregnancies because uh, there's not as much semen being produced there. <clears throat> um, Scrotal circumference is, is an important thing. Uh, this is actually a sheep that's being measured here, but you could do it in bucks as well. Um, you can see in the chart that uh, basically the, the larger the scrotum, the, the more uh, uh, semen they will produce. And uh, if you have a, a buck that has very small testicles and uh, the very small and the very hard, you're probably not going to get much conception rate from the bucks you're using on them, which he's probably going to have reduced uh, uh, libido anyway. So if you're, if you're going to be collecting or using bucks, just a few quick things to think about. If you're getting uh, a buck collected, uh, you, each collector has their own guidelines, so you just basically need to follow those for, for that. Um, but in general, you know, you clean wash, uh, like I mentioned before, the shave that prepuce area, make sure his, his feet are trimmed, and you have to have an ID on the buck, whether it's a tattoo or an ear tag or, or some sort of verifiable ID, because uh, these bucks do get registered. Uh, if uh, registered a bit is also in the in the manner of uh, with, with the straws identified and so forth so they have to be able to verify that the buck is who you say that buck is um, use a few does to get uh, to get him going and then separate him for for uh, several weeks uh, before collection <clears throat> um, just a few don't transport with does in the trailer, obviously, because then he's going to breed them. Uh, you know, make sure that he's on good nutrition. Make sure that that uh, that phosphorus calcium ratio is is been maintained. Uh, use no antibiotics on him uh, because that does affect the 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 semen quality and the semen. Um, um, the semen amounts. Uh, over time. So if you're looking to collect a buck or even use them on those, you don't, you want him to be in prime shape. And if he'd been sick, uh, you know, it's even six weeks before it will affect that, that semen quality. And that's not a good animal to be using to service or, or get collected. Um, do make sure that they're not uh, near a year old. I mean, bucks will definitely be breed earlier. I've seen some of them try and, and succeed actually at uh, five months old, but that's not a recommended thing. They should be closer to a year when they started to get a little bit more maturation and a little bit of size, because if they start too early, it'll just stunt their growth and they'll never really get to a good size in, in adequate time. And a critical thing is um, make sure the buck is handleable because I have seen too many bucks that get aggressive, which is in their nature, but 
uh, you don't want them too friendly, but you want them to be able to be handled by people so you can get them collected or you can move a buck to the breeding pen and so forth and without being attacked. <clears throat> um, so always keep in mind that the biggest impact you can make is having uh, an elite buck. I mean, because he's half the, he's half your offspring each time you use him. So that's that's a very critical thing that you need to have in the uh, in your bank, genetics bank. Um, so this is basically a uh, we're getting into some production parameters here. This is a, just a copy of a, a milk production, a DHI milk production sheet. And uh, we could spend quite a bit of time going through all the details on, on, a, on the sheet because there's a volume of information there. But basically what it's telling you is that in the, like in a 305 day lactation, you know, how many pounds of milk did she produce? What kind of fat percent, how many fats, of, pounds of fat, how many pounds of protein, percentage of protein and so forth, uh, actual completed lactation, what that ran. And uh, you can see some of them, they milk X amount in 305 day lactations, but they've actually gone on to, for this, this specific doe went on to 486 days before she finished that lactation. So, <clears throat> Um, again, the volume of information there. Um, so this is this is actually a um, USDA genetic evaluation for bucks, and each breed, whether it's Alpine, Toggenberg, or or Sonnen, uh, has a listing of of all the bucks. But generally, the the, uh, the top fifteen percent get published, and what that's based on is is the the does. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the daughters of the bucks that are on test. And again, for in, if in order to prove a buck, uh, the daughters have to be on test. Everybody has to be registered. You want know, the dam, uh, the sire, and then obviously the, uh, the offspring have to be registered. And then um, it's based on how many herds, how many daughters, how many lactations and so forth. And um, it's always interesting because even even at uh, a, a top proven buck, generally you'll never see more than a couple of hundred daughters or lactations. You know, if you look at a, a bull proof, there are thousands and thousands in a bull proof, and that's and that's a real indicator of of, of the, the you know the p potential uh, genetics that that bull is passing on. With bucks uh, being that there's just not very many large herds uh, that are on test that have a significant number of does, uh, a buck proof is never that indicative, but, but it's the best we can get. Um, the linear appraisal is based on the confirmation part of the animal. And it's done um, in this country, it's done by the American Dairy Association. And they use a, uh, body confirmation traits. Uh, there's, there's 13 primarily, and there's one secondary trait. And they just basically measure each animal and, and look at the traits and score them, which it's, it's a good thing to have because obviously a, a weak confirmation animal will not, uh, will not necessarily hold up a, a production. They may be a beautiful animal to look at, but if they're not, uh, if they're not all a dairy type animal, um, they, they just will not hold up. And that's what you definitely need because you're, you're looking for production and confirmation as a combination. <clears throat> and so this is, you know, it can be, this is valuable for, for anyone, whether it's a large herd or whether it's um, a small herd or a seed stock operation. Um, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a thing to have, but Again, large operations tend not to do the linear appraisal because it is an expense to put out, which is actually the same with the DHI production. I've had a number of people over the years say, well, you know, I, I can't afford uh, the DHI milk production records. And I've always said, I don't know how you can afford to not have it because I don't, I don't know how uh, you can manage 
uh, milk production without knowing actual milk production and what they're giving in the volume and the uh, and the uh, protein and, and uh, fat contents and so forth and how you you move into a plan and and, and uh, improve your genetics and all those components uh, without having that knowledge to begin with um, and it's similar with linear but linear you can you you know you, you learn to to know your stock and you don't have to do a linear appraisal on each animal to to move forward uh, but it's not it's not a bad thing to have um, so this is again the uh, very quickly what some of the things that the linear appraisal looks at you know, in the store, uh, in stature and dairiness, uh, you know, the angles of the rump, uh, utter attachment, you know, the utter placement. Uh, it's all things that, you know, would uh, be the ideal. Uh, what you're looking for is trying to find that ideal utter and, and form for each animal and work towards that. And there's a score that works with that. So you can work with your production and your, uh, your uh, linear appraisal scores to move forward on a, on a better animal. <clears throat> this is basically um, from a French, uh, a similar thing as linear appraisal, but they don't go quite the depth on each component of every component like the American Association does. Um, so this is basically a, a, a utter profile that uh, they use to gauge, but it's very, very based very similarly. And, and the, the goal is again, to get to that better animal that's gonna produce for you and hold up better through a lactation. <clears throat> um, very important to keep track of your information and there's any number of ways of doing that. I mean, I've seen people use calendars and notebooks and and uh, certainly spreadsheets are very helpful. Um, a good dairy records program, they're out there. Uh, there's good ones, there's bad ones. Uh, I found that most of them have uh, been put together for dairy cows. And so some of them actually can be used for goats if you don't mind the, the fact that there's cows and calves and bulls in the in the program uh, and they can be some of them can be tweaked you know for a 305 day lactation or for and that, well that the cows have that as well but uh, like a five month gestation and so forth um, so again there's a lot of them out there some of them very expensive some of them uh, not so much but what I also find is that a lot of them are more the record keeping and the the components for milk production is not there. And I, I've found that again, that's very important because you, how are you gonna control your milk production if you can't pull up reports and so forth and see who's doing what. And so you can actually rank your animals and, and know your breeding program, uh, you know, which bucks you're gonna breed to which does and so forth. And it's, it's all very vital. So the, the, a good quality program is definitely uh, very worthwhile and, and, and very necessary, I say. Um, so this is one of the um, sources of information and I just recently updated this. Um, so it, and it's active and it's very, very good. But again, it's based on animals that are on DHI production. It's not gonna be based on animals that are not. So, but if, if, if they are, you can find complete pedigrees, yields, herd tests for each end you can go, for example, if you have a herd that, that's trying to sell you some animals and they're on test, you can actually go on, in this site and you can find out the herd records for each individual doe that they have on test. Um, so it, it, um, it, it's very vi verifiable information. And it's also very important information because you can decide, well, these goats aren't as good as they say they are, or yeah, that's exactly what they're saying, and that's good. And you can also use it to research uh, herds that you might want to consider uh, buying stock from if, if you're looking for that, or even the semen uh, from certain bucks if they're looking to put out uh, uh, straws of semen from certain bucks, you can look back and say, okay, well, this is their herd average. This is what they're doing. 
and so forth. And you can access it any number of ways, um, whether it's ID or herd code or animal names. So there's any, any number of ways to get that. Um, the other place that's also very good, I find, and it's really become better over the years is the uh, American Dairy Goat Association genetics uh, portion. And you can do very similar as you did with the previous uh, organization uh, that's, that's based on cattle, but, it's, but it has their goat component. So that, let me, don't confuse that. Uh, American Dairy Goat Association is just basically um, coming off pedigrees, but there is a milk component in there that they've imported from the USDA site. So you can actually find out the milk production as well. Uh, and then they, of course, they include their, if the, if the herd has been the linear appraised, those, those uh, criteria are in there and they can be matched with the milk production. So you can actually uh, do an interesting thing, which is do a, a planning pedigree. You can actually take one of your does and, and breed it to somebody's buck all, all online and come up with a pedigree and see if, if that's something you really want to do and what the improvement will be or what the uh, inbreeding coefficient might be, which is all very important. Um, so you can do a lot of planning with both of those things. <clears throat> and finally, um, and the least, and I always leave that for last because I, it's, 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 it's a tough thing to do, but every herd uh, needs to consider culling. Uh, at some point. And the reasons for that can be many. Um, certainly milk production, if, she, if, if a doe is not holding up for production, um, for whatever reason, whether it's not, she's not a short lactation or, or uh, not meet it getting you the, the protein or the butter fat that you need for your herd, then that's certainly uh, a criteria confirmation. If she's just not holding up well, or that udder is just after the third lactation is dragging on the ground, that's probably not an animal you want to keep. So that certainly a consideration. Um, health always, you know, if it's an unhealthy, thrifty animal or an animal that constantly gets parasites and you can't keep it under control, that's something that you need to uh, probably get out of your herd. Uh, mastitis, always uh, a consideration not necessarily a problem for every herd, but it can be, and, and that's not something you want. Um, the final is, uh, is animal disposition. I've seen animals that are just the boss goat, no matter who you put them with, where you put them, and they're just basically nasty individuals, and uh, to the point where even in, in a milking parlor, they're just biting and and bossing everybody around. So those animals just don't really have a place in your herd. Um, but, you know, and, and, and also if you're trying to keep a herd at a certain size, you know, it, as you grow, uh, you will find that you, you have to take the animals off the back end to make room for the new stock. And you always have to keep in mind that your young stock, if you're doing things right and you're doing a good breeding program, that your young stock is is the is the next generation of better genetics than the previous. So, in order to make room for that, uh, you have to get animals off the other end, and uh, these are the various reasons that you you can come up with to do that. <clears throat> and finally, this is my contact information. If I can, if I can ever help you with anything. <clears throat>